in verse 20, Behold now, so that phrase is used again, that's self-explanatory. Usually, behold now is, so uh, here it is. So basically, it's trying to give the other person whom he's addressing to attention. That's usually words or a phrase that you will use to get a person to be attentive towards. This city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. So he's saying that there's this particular city that's nearby, that's very near that we can run away to, and it's a very little city, he reasons. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So he's saying right here, oh, let me escape toward that place. So that's the idea about there and hither kind of combined together, like over there. Let me escape over there, because isn't it a little one? It's not that big. And I will be able to live, survive. Usually the word soul, when it is used, it's referring to the real you. It's referring to the person, the real person, your personality, your personal actual self. So he's saying, I will be able to live. I'll be able to survive. That way I don't die up there in the mountains at verse 19, he says. Now, I want you to look at the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Now, you have to know that that is the devil's trick, and you should not fall for that. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Lot, again, perfectly demonstrates a saved worldly Christian. He is not a Christian. Christians did not exist in this time. I don't know why some onliners there don't get that memo, and then they're always accusatory. They say, Lot's not a Christian. What are you talking about? My people didn't get that impression. What they were learning is that he demonstrates, he pictures what a worldly Christian would act. So I don't know why people get upset about that. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5. And notice right here, worldly Christian you, don't follow the example of Lot by thinking, when God says, I have to take that thing away from you, and you go, God, God, don't take this thing away, or let me do this thing, because isn't it little? Let me just do this little thing. Let me skip one little Sunday. Let me skip one little day of Bible reading. Let me do this little one hour with my time in sin. Uh, it's just a little job, God. It's not a big deal, this job, what I'm doing. I mean, it takes away just a little bit of my time away, probably, but I'll go to church here and there, and I'll give the offering. Think about the offering. We'll go way up, Lord, if you give me this job. That's the mentality. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Notice at verse 9, a little, see, leaven. What happens with a little leaven? Leaveneth the whole lump. You got to realize it only takes a little bit of sin for it to grow, boom, like that. That's what sin does. Okay, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis 19. Return to Genesis chapter 19. So don't mess around with sin. A little bit of sin increases to bigger sins. Didn't you learn that before already uh, with Lot's case? Remember, he didn't go inside Sodom at the beginning. What did he do? went to the plains of Jordan at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. But then just a little bit of sin, in parentheses, is actually quote-unquote, quote-unquote little. It's not actual sin. This little, it means this. It means boom. That's what it means. It's big. But you're so blinded from seeing the big because you keep looking at the little. And then when you actually hit the big, you still think it's little, right, Lot? That's why you would go as so far as to say, Lot, here are my two virgin daughters. Why don't you take them, not the angels? See, you go that far. You go that far. Now let's look at verse 21. And he said unto him, so Lot is going to speak to the angel. See, I have, uh, excuse me, God is speaking to Lot. See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. So when I say God is speaking to him, obviously uh, this is not the angel of the Lord. 
because the angel of the Lord, he was talking to Abraham, and then the two angels went down. But a lot of times you're going to notice when the angels are speaking, they're speaking on the behalf of the Lord, on God. So it could be, so I'm not saying it is God speaking here at verse 21, but you have to keep that possibility open. If you want a proper interpretation of Scripture, it's always important to keep possibilities open unless they're plainly wrong in Scripture. Okay? So, the angel speaks to Lot. All right, see here, I accepted what you said concerning this thing also, about concerning this matter in going to the city of Zoar, running away. And I won't overthrow Zoar, he's saying. I won't overthrow this small city. For the which thou hast spoken, meaning about this city you referred to. I'm not going to overthrow it. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Meaning, hurry up. You hurry on up now. Escape over there to that little city, Zoar, that Lot wanted to flee to. Because I won't be able to do anything until you go over there, until you come to that city there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. So hence, from that day on, that little city was called Zoar. Now, that's very interesting that I want you to note here. The little city that Lot wanted to flee to, it means little. That's what Zoar means. Now, notice that you can preach a very good sermon out of this. So, Christian, what is your Zoar? I think that's a good sermon. Do you want me to park it over there and we don't have to finish the rest of the chapter? I can preach a whole sermon on that one. What is your Zoar? Zoar means little. And that's why you can't go all the way for the Lord. If it was called Zoar from that time hence, see that? From that time hence, that means before it wasn't called Zoar. So there are two questions right here. One, what's the previous name? What was the previous name? And two, isn't it a city before Lot claimed it, the territory for himself? If you recall at the book of Genesis, usually cities are named after the people who first land on that territory, who claim that territory for themselves. So how can Lot do that when there's already a territory there, when there are already inhabitants there? How was he able to take over that city and name it after himself? So that's going to be interesting we're going to look at. So who's the owner? Now, I don't know of anyone else who taught this, so just take what I have with the grain of salt and don't post all over online saying, you know, oh, what a heretic, you know, oh, he's so messed up, he's getting crazy. No, it's because, one, perhaps maybe you're not reading your Bible as carefully as you should. Come on. Okay? Me, because I'm trying to carefully read the word, every word, I want to find out the meaning behind every word. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And even if it's a guesswork, then at least I say that it is guesswork. But I am trying to find the meaning behind the scriptures, are you? Or do you not find the meaning yourself and you just easily accuse? So I hope you're not that tight. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 19 and verse 22, what was the city called before? That's why it makes sense if you look at Genesis 14. Now remember... The five kings versus the four kings, right? Do you remember that story? Now, remember the five kings, they were allianced with Sodom and Gomorrah. So it was Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and remember Zoar, right? So then we got a question here. Why is it that at Genesis 19, we see here at Genesis 19, therefore it was called Zoar, like from henceforth. Wasn't it called Zoar before? Actually, Genesis 14 hints that may not be the case. Look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 2. That these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shanab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of what? Bela, 
which is Zohar? Oh, that's interesting. Now, why did the author of Genesis write that way? Because the author of Genesis is Moses. He knew that it's called Zohar yeah. at his day. Mm -hmm. But then he's trying to point out at that timeline, it was called Bila. Now, here's another example. I want you to also look at verse 8. Verse 8. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of what? Bela, Bela, the same is Zoar. In parentheses, like that's this, Bela, during that time, was, is what you know as Zoar. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay, so then it was called Bela before. But then who's the owner? That's the question. Because undoubtedly there were inhabitants there at that time. So then it's not like Lot got first dibs on that city and called it for himself. Well, we know it was originally called Bella, right? If it was originally called Bella, why was Lot able to change it to Zoar? How was that done? So then here's the guesswork. Go back to uh, Genesis 19 and then Isaiah 15. I want your hand to go to two places. Two places. Isaiah 15, Isaiah 15, and then I also want you to go to Genesis 19. Now look at this here. Who was able to claim Zoar is actually the inhabitants of Moab. Now if you know your story, I'm going to point it out to you when we compare to Genesis 19. Moab or the Moabites, guess who they're from? They're from Lot's daughter, one of Lot's daughters. So then it shows right here that Lot, for some reason, somehow, or his generations after him, they were able to claim the city of Zoar and name it for themselves Zoar. So look at Gen Isaiah 15, Isaiah 15, verse 1, verse, uh, verse 5, verse 5. My heart shall cry out for Moab, his fugitive shall flee unto where? Zoar. That whole chapter is about the judgment against Moab, for some of you who didn't know. So the whole context here is Moab. Okay, so Zoar belongs to Moab. Look at Genesis 19, verse, Genesis chapter 19, verse 37, verse 37. So the firstborn of Lot. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. Okay, so we can see right here that the owner is going to be Lot or at the very least Lot's offspring. Then how did he get that city, right? How was he able to get that city and name it Zoar when it was previously called Bela? Here is the interesting part. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. Wait a minute. Isn't this contradictory? When we look back at Genesis chapter 19, verse 20 and 22, remember Lot said, I want to go to Zoar because I'm afraid of the mountains. But right here... He's saying, I'm afraid of Zoar, so I'm going to go to the mountains. What happened? He changed his mind. He changed his mind. You can easily guess why, because we're going to later find out, if you look at the context and the flow of it, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, that whole context is God overthrowing the cities and the surrounding territories. And the judgment is so fierce that Lot's wife was even killed herself. So because this is so horrifying and scary to him, think about it. If you're like, evacuate the premises of San Francisco, and then the whole community and the surrounding plains was just burned down to the ground because of God's anger, the San Andreas fault where it's under, just split and hell just busted wide open. I wouldn't be surprised one of the gates of hell is the San Andreas fault where it's at, you know. If we believe the lava comes from hell, right? So it stands to reason. So then if hell breaks loose, which is what happened to Sodom, and I'm going to show you later, and the surrounding territories, do you feel comfortable... To be at a city that's very close 
to San Francisco, especially if they practice its beep, beep, beep uh, practices. No. If, you, if this little nearby city copycatted this major city that burned to the ground in its lifestyle, and then it showed the anger of the Lord and it just burned everything to the ground and melted it, you would be scared and you'd run, you'd run away too. Yeah. So think about it. It's very possible that the Lord, he may have destroyed the territory of Zoar later on, or the territory of Zoar, the inhabitants, they somehow got away because they got scared too. So then Lot was able to claim that territory or at least his offspring after him because maybe the daughters want to get away from the hermit life and enter the cities, go back to the cities. It may have been possible they all went down there. Because you can tell that Lot's daughters, when they went to the mountains, that there's a practice at verse 31, 32. It shows there all their life, their happiness in you was a sodomite lifestyle. It was the San Francisco lifestyle. I want to go back over there. I mean, Castro Lane over there. It's so beautiful when you look at it. A bunch of beep over there, but man, it's just so beautiful. I just want to go back over there. So it stands to reason all this, but that's only a theory, but it's very interesting. Okay, go back to verse 23 now. Genesis 19, 23. Let's continue on. Continuing on. Now, what happened once they were trying to go to uh, Zoar? The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Once Lot was able to enter into Zoar, that's when the sun rose, sunrise. Now, this is a very good passage on the post-tribulation rapture. So what you're seeing right here is a perfect demonstration of the wrath of God. So this is no doubt the wrath of God, where he burns down Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if you know your Bible, the wrath of God, when it pours out actual fire, there are many cases of the wrath of God in the tribulation. You get the seven seals, for example, the seven vials, and etc. However, there is a particular wrath of God that's all fiery. The fiery wrath of God, which is in Armageddon when he comes down at his second advent. So when he comes down at the second advent, or otherwise called Armageddon, he opens up hell just like what he, do, what he did with Sodom and Gomorrah that I'm going to show you later on, but not now. But the point is, is that in the second advent, he comes down in his wrath and fiery fury, and actually it turns into hell itself. So this is a good picture of that, Sodom and Gomorrah, of his second advent. But with Lot and his daughters fleeing, it's a perfect example of actually escaping such wrath. So hence, we get a post-tribulation rapture, or a pre-wrath rapture. You might say, wait a minute, I thought you believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah, I do. Yeah. It shows how limited people's knowledge of the scriptures are, which is very sad. The simple answer is there's a rapture before the tribulation, and there's a rapture sometime after the tribulation. Mm -hmm. And I've given you videos demonstrating that. I'm not going to do a whole teaching on that, because I just want to concentrate only on Genesis 19. So let's focus on this post-tribulation rapture part here. First of all, notice it's when the sun rose. Okay, what watch of the day is this? You're going to look at Mark 13. Mark 13. Look at the book of Mark, chapter 13. Sunrise in the Bible is also known as the fourth watch. The fourth watch. And for people who like to time the tribulation, or even the rapture itself, they go by the watches, which is very important. So notice how in the scriptures that sunrise is also known as the fourth watch. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so notice that we're going to look 
at Mark chapter 13. The Bible reads at verse 35, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. The context right here is when Jesus comes down. At even, first, or at midnight, second, or at the cock crowing, third, or in the what? Morning, fourth. So we see right here the morning is known as the fourth watch. Now I want you to also turn to Luke 17. Luke 17. Now notice when Jesus talks about the post-tribulation rapture, he uses the example of Lot. Now, I've taught you in Genesis chapter 5 a really strong picture for the pre-tribulation rapture. And it's not Noah, it's Enoch. It's Enoch. Noah pictures more of that post-tribulation rapture of a saint undergoing through the tribulation in the sheet and the wrath of God during judgment. But he's able to survive it, just like a tribulation has to endure, survive to the end to be saved. Matthew 24. So I've given a little bit examples of that. Enoch, he's during at a time of the last days, right? When the, when the signs of the tribulation with those Nephilim, Satan on earth, and everything going on, those last moments of that. So Enoch perfectly pictures a church entering into those last days phases, but then once he's raptured out, the actual end time hits, and then Noah starts to build. And then when Noah starts to build, he survives the wrath of God. So Noah pictures a good example of the post-tribulation rapture escaping the wrath of God, who do you think also is another example, is Lot? Look at Luke 17. Look at the book of Luke, chapter 17. Notice at verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, what is this referring to? This is referring to his coming. In verse, let's see right here, 22. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. Verse 24, For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So notice right here, this is no doubt the coming of Jesus Christ. That's the language it's referring to. But then he uses the example of Noah, at verse 26 and 27, right? And then Lot at verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So notice right here, just like when Jesus Christ is going to reveal himself at the second advent, it's going to be the same thing like the days of Lot. So then there is a remnant that escapes, right? But then notice right here a rapture at verse 34. I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Notice right here. This is a famous passage used for the rapture. One is taken while the other is left behind, they would say. But this passage is not referring to the church being raptured. A lot of Christian churches get, use that passage mistakenly for themselves. The Left Behind series uses that. Uh, Thief in the Night uh, infamously used this text the wrong way as well. This text supports the pre-wrath, the post-tribulation argument. It is a rapture for the tribulation saint. But this is not for the Christian church. The Christian church has, has their own rapture, which I'm not going to expound it here. And please, don't, I'm sick and tired, don't throw in a comment about, what about this passage? What about that one? Trying to debunk pre-trib. I'm not doing that in this video. Why don't you not be lazy? Look at my other videos on pre-tribulation rapture. Simple. Okay, go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. So we see that verse 23 perfectly pictures a post-tribulation rapture, pre-wrath rapture for the tribulation saint. 
Now, verse 24, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Okay, so God is raining. So it's like from above Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, brimstone and fire. From where? From God. And it came out of heaven. So it comes out from above. Verse 25, And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Notice he overthrew, so meaning that he destroyed the cities, all those cities, and then the entire plain. Remember, that was where Lot originally wanted to stay, the plains of Jordan. God burned that one to the ground. And then all the inhabitants who lived in the city as well. And anything that grew on the ground. So God destroyed it to a fair thee well. Basically, he just destroyed it all. Oh, isn't this beautiful how we're preserving Mother Nature in the city of Berkeley? And God don't care. Boom, he destroys it. Why not just those, wic those wicked blankety blanks, you know? Which I'm not going to say because the probably Mr. System there might catch it. So I'll just call it blankety blank, okay? Why don't you just burn down the blankety blank, Lord? Why do you have to burn down the beautiful trees and everything? Because it disgusts God. It disgusts God so much because anything that has to do with sin, even the things that touch it, he's so holy he cannot stand it. That's God's nature. So people don't understand God's wrath. They only emphasize his love so much they forget his wrath. If you understand his wrath, you Christians would be more careful with how you live too and not give the excuse like Lot, it's a little. You saw what God did with little, right? <laughs> even just the plains of Jordan itself. We, gotta under, we have to share that same anger against sin with the Lord. And if you ever wonder why you always fall into temptation, why your Christian life is not improving, simple. You got a Zoar, remember. You got a little somewhere. Okay, verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him. So the wife right here, she actually looked behind him lot so she's in front of him she looks behind him because she's thinking about oh you know why is, why did he have to leave and pack up and go away he said that the lord told him that this was not the place and god had a different calling for him why did he do that and there's that frustration that uneasiness uneasiness and tension looking back and going Oh, my beautiful furniture, my beautiful home, you know, uh, my beautiful trees, the lawn, the garden, and the everything. And oh, and then all of a sudden, boom, the Lord struck her down too. You know why? This is a time of God's wrath. That's not a time to be sympathetic. It's a time to run. <laughs> it's a time to run, Christians. Uh, we don't really understand that ourselves. Why? Because we're too spoiled in the age of grace that we're in. So we're under the age of grace. So living under that age of grace, we don't understand God's wrath, unfortunately. So then, why did God strike her down too? Because she looked behind him. So she disobeyed God. What did God say? God pointed out that uh, he wanted them to escape. And he wanted them to get away from the city. If you look at verse, uh, let's see right here, verse 17, he says, escape for thy life, look not behind thee. See that? God made it clear, don't look behind you, all right? God made it clear, don't look back, take up your cross and follow me, right? And then because that one turn, it costed her life. So it's very important. Now, I do want to say this. What I want to say is, it's actually, before you think God is too harsh, it's not because, to my understanding, God striking her down like that, even though I said it that way. It's not that, oh, you disobey me, bam, like that. No, it's because his judgment is so severe against sin, he's warning them, look, don't look back, because that's how bad the consequence of sin is. The consequence of sin is so bad that you shouldn't look behind. So it's not a matter of God striking the person down. It's a matter of the consequence of sin that strikes it down. The problem with people nowadays is if you are going, uh, if you're reaping what you've sown, 
It's more so of not God chastising you, but more so of your sin. We have to understand that. So we can't really blame God. It's a matter of you have to blame sin for that. So why do you play with sin? Why are you merciful with sin when it's going to strike you down like that? So we have to take that account seriously. We don't take sin seriously. So then she became a pillar of salt. So that's how she became a pillar of salt. Now let's go through 24, 25, 26, how this all ties to hell. Why is it that I teach that Sodom and Gomorrah got burned with hell fire? So I've explained a little bit of that at Genesis 14. So I'll expound it again right here. First of all, there is a question at verse 24. The Bible shows that it rained, right? So it rained fire and brimstone out of Sodom, uh, out of heaven, excuse me, upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So, uh, pastor, for you to say that it came from hell doesn't make sense because it fell from God out of heaven. Well, you have to understand this. First of all, there are these signs that it is hell because if you look at verse 24 it says fire and brimstone right all right what's fire and brimstone look at revelation 21 8 revelation 21 8 it's hell hell has fire and brimstone so we're going to establish several cases on why sodom and gomorrah when it was burned with fire and brimstone or when it was burned with fire from the lord that this is referring to hell so here are several cases to establish these arguments so why is it hell one it's because of fire and brimstone that's what the bible called it fire and brimstone well why did you say uh what are you going to do with it coming out of heaven well that's where number two comes in that people don't really take time to think about People today, there's a lot of Christians who actually talk about today that the lava that we get from the volcano eruption from the core of the earth, that's where hell is. So think about it. When hell is referring to vol volcano activity, then think about it. Isn't it raining? It is raining. And that's where you can get the brimstone as well. Uh, I had given a teaching at Revelation where it could possibly refer to like some kind of stone of fire, but sulfur is also called stones of fire. It's more likely that it's referring to sulfur, but I leave the interpretation open to some kind of stones of fire. Besides that, returning back to Genesis 19, the point is that all of this sulfur activity, lava activity, fire activity, brimstone activity, raining out from the sky but coming from hell itself volcano fits it very perfectly so you notice that god he was uh, the people were thinking we're doing so well in hawaii over here and we have a different party different kind of belief and system but it's just so pleasant out here and then god just has to just do one of those little volcanoes okay now look at Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That is referring to hell. See, fire and brimstone. Another one is Jude. Go to the book of Jude. Notice when Sodom and Gomorrah was burned to the ground, it was burned with hell fire. It wasn't burned with just fire out of heaven, some simple fire out of heaven. No, this kind of fire is not simple. It's eternal fire. It's hell fire. Look at Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? eternal fire all right go to mark 9 now mark 9 so there's no doubt it was burned with hell fire so then number three why is that the case 
And I will temporarily move aside here, that way the people can see the writing. So number three, it's because the Bible says it was actually burned with hellfire. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it's going to be cut off here, so. So it was no doubt burned with eternal fire. Now think about it. If it's burned up with eternal fire, shouldn't it be burning everlasting still over there? So why is it not burning still? Meaning, it makes a lot of sense. How do you get the rain from the volcanic activity? Something erupts below as well. The below is cracking up. You know what's going on? Hell is splitting open. So when hell is splitting open, you see the lava down there, and then also the volcanoes and all that kind of stuff pouring out, spurting out fire out of heaven. So then you can guess what happened. Sodom and Gomorrah sunk down to hell. Now, think about this. Where was Sodom and Gomorrah located? You remember? I showed you at Genesis 14. I showed you at Genesis 14. I'm not going to show you again. The Dead Sea. So then, all you have to do is think about the Dead Sea here. That's the fourth reason why it would make a lot of sense that Sodom and Gomorrah sunk down to hell. Why? Because you get what they say about the Dead Sea, one of the lowest elevation areas, right? How do you get that? Unless there was some kind of sinking, maybe. Unless the Lord did something there to create it that low. So look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We're going to look at Mark 9. I just only want it on the whiteboard. That's it. If I have to move, then I'll move, okay? Just let me know. We're going to look at Mark 9. Now remember, Lot's wife was turned into a what? Pillar of salt. Is that correct? Now look what the Bible says at Mark 9. So it ain't just a simple pillar of salt you have to understand. This is actually salted with fire, hellfire itself. Look at Mark 9 and then verse 49. The Bible says, uh, verse 48, 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That's hell, right? If you still doubt that, then all you have to do is look at verse 47. It says hell fire, okay? <laughs> then look at verse 49. For everyone shall be what? Salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. How about that? So notice right here that this all makes sense. That's why the Dead Sea, we see all that salt activity. So all of this ties together that this makes a lot of sense that Sodom and Gomorrah, yes, I believe, is sunk down to hell when we look at all the scriptures. Not only that, if you look at the archaeological evidences, it will weigh that, it will point that out as well. Let's go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Uh, Luke, one more passage is Luke 17 again, Luke 17. So then, if that's the wrath of God and people can risk in losing their soul, that's why they have to endure to the end during the tribulation, which is very different from our salvation. Christians are not saved that way. Christians are saved by grace through faith. You don't endure something. You don't put an effort to something. You don't work for something. It's easy for us, salvation by grace through faith. But during the tribulation, their salvation is different where they have to have endurance. So because there's this endurance, and Jesus said that in the wrath of God that's demonstrated at the second advent, he says it's going to picture like what? The days of what? Remember? Lot, right? If it's going to be like the days of Lot where they have to like run for their lives, hang on by the skin of their teeth, so to say, who is he going to use as an example of the person who failed on that matter? Luke 17, verse 31. Look at this. In that day he, sh he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. So see, you have to forsake the world that time. Why? Because the world is owned by the Antichrist. Not only that, God's going to burn up the world. He's going to punish them at Armageddon. So God's like, don't turn back, run away, survive. Because verse 32, remember Lot's wife. That's a very important verse. 
So the tr imagine if you're a tribulation saint that time. And then, you know, you get someone messing up in your church or in your family, and then before they go prodigal life, it's not the same like today's Christians. You know, today's Christians can't really do this, but at the tribulation saying it is because it's like your soul hangs in the balance here. So before that person leaves, you say, remember Lot's wife. So before that person walks out of the church at the tribulation, imagine these people saying, okay, you can leave, but... Remember Lot's wife. Person leaves from the family and home. I hate this Christianity that we live in. And remember Lot's wife. <laughs> Look at verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall what? Preserve it. And then 34, 35, 36 is that rapture. Okay, go back to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. How about that? We'll look at verse 27 now. Verse 27. The Bible says, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. So Abraham, uh, he got up early in the morning. Where? At the place where he and God stood before and talked to each other. Remember, that was at a probably like a hilltop or at a location that was nearby Sodom. Where, where, not nearby Sodom, but where you can see Sodom. If you recall at Genesis chapter 18. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. So Abraham, he was looking to, at the direction where Sodom and Gomorrah was at because he was obviously concerned about Lot. That could be telling and he's wondering what happened to him. And he looked toward the direction where, where all that plain was, the land of the plain, because remember, that's where Lot originally resided, originally, before he moved inside the city. And beheld, which means he saw, he was looking, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. So lo is usually that metaphor, that uh, phrase that's uh, used, that English expression that's used as an attentive word, all right? So look what happened here. That's the idea. Lo and behold, right? The smoke that's coming out of that location, that country, it was going up like as if it was a furnace. Verse 29. And it came to pass, again, phrase that's commonly used in the Bible, meaning what happened next, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. So what happened here when God was destroying the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the areas that were nearby its plain, God remembered Abraham. When he remembered Abraham, that's the reason why he was able to send Lot out during the middle of that destruction. Okay, so remember that I'm trying to explain each and every word here, so I hope you're looking at that, okay? I know it can sound a little bit redundant or a little bit boring, but this is so important because the goal of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is for you to under understand each and every word, okay? It's not just doctrine or some nugget or even preaching. No, it's more so of each and every word that you understand which becomes a preaching, which can show you a nugget, which can show you a doctrine. So I hope that you're paying attention to that. Otherwise, the goal of this teaching is gone, okay? So as I'm explaining here, he was able to send Lot out of the... Uh, during, uh, he was able to send Lot away out of that place during the middle of that destruction, during the middle of that overthrow, during that time when he was destroying the cities where Lot dwelt, where Lot was living at that time. Isn't it interesting that right here in this verse, God was not remembering Lot. When he was destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't care much about Lot. He was caring more about Abraham. So I believe another reason why Lot was able to escape is because of Abraham, not because of Lot himself. There may have been some parts where Lot received that grace and mercy, but it makes you also think about this. It makes you think about 
that in spite of his, uh, what the Bible called that righteous soul vexed, his righteous soul with the conversation of the wicked every day, that in spite of that, he had a very bad testimony. So God could have burned him to the ground, just like he did with Lot's wife, right? But then he allowed him an escape route because of Abraham at verse 29. Because of Abraham. A lot of time when you receive grace and mercy as a worldly Christian, know this, it's not because of you. Come on. It's not because of, well, God loves me, so I can keep gambling with this mercy and grace. You ever thought about it's maybe your family praying for you? It's your church praying for you? And maybe that's the reason why you receive mercy and grace all this time? So God, you'd be surprised that uh, God wouldn't care much about you when you get yourself hurt. So then he'll allow some things to happen so that he can teach you a lesson. But because he cares about that person praying for you or that person loving you or that person is going to be brokenhearted, maybe that's the reason why he allowed you to escape in the middle of that destruction. There's a passage on that in Deuteronomy where God says, remember, when you claim these lands, it's not because of your goodness. It's because of the wickedness of these inhabitants right here. Okay, let's look at verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. Okay, so he didn't stay in Zoar. So he went away from Zoar. As soon as verse 29, when God destroyed all the cities of the plain, Lot's like, he didn't stay there for long. He got out of Zoar and lived in the mountain. He, originally, he was that worldly Christian. This is good preaching. He was that worldly Christian. Oh, God, don't, I don't want to go in the mountain. That's too tough. And there's no air condition up there. And, you know, I have to build a home from scratch. And, God, it's so tough over there. And then, oh, yeah, what about the consequence of sin? You're, you're more scared of a mountain more than your consequence of sin? When God shows you point blank and then you hit that railroad of the consequence of sin, I know what happens. You know what those people do? They do a 180 and they go, okay, I'll go to the mountain. Why? Because they've reaped too much already of what they've sown. And it's so sad. I've, know, I've known people and some family members where they come back to church and it's a mountain ride. It would have, been, it would have saved them the trouble. They could have been like Abraham where they didn't have to go up the mountain if they didn't go to the plains of Jordan to begin with, right? But then they go back and then they have to climb up a mountaintop. Why is it? Because they've already dug deep into sin. And so now they have to do a mountain ride to live out their Christianity when they come back to church. But it's funny that they don't care if it's a mountain ride when they come back to church. Why? Because they reap too much what they've sown in sin that they, don't, that they fear that more. So then they come back. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like, you wish you got saved earlier, right? You wish that you uh, got a Christian upbringing, clean living earlier or something like that, right? And then when you got saved, think about it, or you ended up, started attending a Bible-believing church, was it a smooth road? It's such an easy, easy road. We are traveling to... Or was it a mountain ride? Some of you, it was a mountain ride, wasn't it? Why? Because of your life in sin for many years before. So because of that, when you start giving up all of that and living out your Christianity, it's tough. That's why it, earlier, the better. Okay? You know who are going to get away with it? Not pretty much us. It's going to be those kids in the other room. If they'll maintain that. But they'll get away from that mountain climb a lot. They'll get away from that. I avoided a lot of mountain climbs myself. But the reason why I started out the mountain climb is because I was dumb enough to take on a foolish ministry in a tough place. So I'm starting with an area that has so much consequence of sin, right? So because of that, that's why I had to do a mountaintop for the ministry. But if I was in an area that was Bible believers, it wouldn't be that much of a mountaintop, right? So see, you got to understand this. The consequence of sin is really tough and great. It's going to give you a mountaintop, uh, mountain climb, all right? It's going to be a mountain climb experience. So that's why earlier the better. But it's amazing that uh, Lot here, he feared more on the consequence of sin than, than mountain climbing. And you will too if you don't realize that one day. So if I were you, I'd do it now. Now in verse 30, 
he got away. He could care less. And his two daughters with him. So he brought his two daughters along with him when they ran away to the mountains. For he feared to dwell in Zoar because he was afraid to live in Zoar. And he dwelled in a cave. So he was living uh, in a cave. Lost everything. Now, if the angels told him before, you, go, you're going to live the rest of your life in a cave, you think Lot would have ran away from Sodom? No, he wouldn't have. But notice that Lot didn't care. Why? Because he saw the wrath of sin at verse 30. You know, what, excuses about living for God, coming to church, picking up, carrying your cross, go out of the window when you see the wrath of God, when fear of sin comes to the picture here. He and his two daughters, so Lot and his two daughters lived inside that cave. And the firstborn said unto the younger, oh, here we go. Now, this is a good sermon. And if you're going to teach kids or teenagers, this is a good sermon. It's always the older one that speaks to a younger one of their peers. Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Oh, wow, that's pretty extreme. So she's saying right here, our father is up in years and there's no uh, male in, throughout all the earth that's going to come in unto us. So that means where they're able to uh, sexually reproduce children. That's the idea. After the manner of all the earth. So the idea here, isn't it interesting? It's going to be just like how the world does it. Okay, did you see that right there? Did you see that right there? Okay, here's a preaching right here. This is a good preaching. You ready for this? It's always usually when you're at a high school place and then there's someone that, uh, that's the cool person or the older person or a little bit more adult experience, right? And that person will tell you, you know what, this is, uh, this is what they all do. This is the manner of all the earth. We got to catch up and you got to do it, man. Come on, you got to do it. Uh-huh, right? That's how it always starts. And then you look at the book of 1 Kings. Now, you notice this is one of the most stupid advice you'll ever hear in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Okay, look at Genesis chapter 12. I mean, not just, excuse me, 1 Kings 12. 1 Kings 12. This is one of the most stupid advice that was ever given. Not even Sarah with, uh, with her advice to Abraham or other people who gave dumb advice. The most stupid advice you'll ever find in the Bible is usually young people who seem to be the older person to that younger person. So then instead of the parent, it's your that cool guy or that cool girl in high school, right? Or it's your co-worker or someone you know in college. It's your friend. That's, remember this, that's the dumbest advice you'll ever receive. Look at 1 Kings chapter 12. Notice at 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 8. But he forsook the counsel of the old men. So the king forsook the counsel of the elderly which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. So he listened to the counsel of the people who grew up with him, people that he knows. Oh, I got my connections, you know. Oh, who? Who, huh? And then what did the Bible say at the end? Verse 13. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him. And then you'll notice what the Bible says at verse 15. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? So his kingdom split apart. Ruined everything. That's what you get for listening to uh, your friends. So, good advice, huh? <laughs> Sounds like good advice you should follow. Now, it always happens. Preach to the kids that, okay? Now, uh, I want to urge this to our Sunday school teachers, is that when you teach them, don't just teach them something you find interesting. 
Don't teach them something because it's a subject you like. You, I don't do that in my preaching and teaching either. When I preach and teach, I'm thinking about my audience, my people, what they need to hear. Do you understand that? What they need to hear. This is a great passage. And especially for young people, this is from how I see it. Young people are so easily influenced by peers their age. Okay? How do I know that? Because you're the same bunch too. I'm, I was, uh, I've been through the 20s like you, okay? And I know it influences. That's why you have to preach this, okay? Because that's how we can get our young people right with the Lord is that they get the right environment of their peers. And we provide it for them. And that they stay away from that wrong environment, from the wrong peers. Because whether you believe it or not, it is a powerful influence. It sucks them in unconsciously, not just for them, where they unconsciously can't tell. Even you guys, too, can't tell unconsciously. Amen. And you'll know that when you become a parent. That unconsciously, they get seeped in influence and you didn't see that. That's why we take it very seriously in this church about young people. Uh, and uh, I want a follow-up. I'll do a meeting, or sometimes we'll talk to the parents. Why? Because it's so important we rescue our next generation. You keep an eye out, okay? Because if you don't keep an eye out, your schools will. That's why your kids are getting brainwashed. You know what you need to do? You need to keep an eye out on this younger generation more than the schools, more than the TV. If the young kids are, have spent more time with that stinking screen... And with that peers with the school environment around them more than you because why? You're just too busy. You have your own thing or I know the adult excuse, okay? You cannot allow that because that's the devil's tactic to attract you grown adults with the world where you're busy with the world and then he uses the world to steal away the kids. Yeah, that's good preaching. Amen. Okay. So notice uh, right here at verse 32, the horrible advice. Uh, we're going to sleep with our father so that we can produce seed. What horrible advice. But where did she learn that from? Verse 31, after the manner of all the earth. All right, but we're going to explain that a little bit more next time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Now, God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for the truth of your words and for lessons that we can glean so that we don't have to follow the wrong examples, but follow good examples. Be wary of the wrong things that we should avoid. Thank you so much for the book that is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path in the midst of darkness that we live in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.